Hi, everyone. Oops. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, um, I wish we could do something uh, like an informal conversation, but we'll see what we can do. I think it's possible because we're not that many of us. Um, so I've been doing journalism for many, many years, but I want to tell you why I've chosen to focus so much on uh, women and women's so-called issues, you know, and I'll tell you why I don't believe in that. Um, and the way it happened, so it was right after 9-11, after the, the World Trade Center attacks, um, one day, so my, I, I myself have lost my husband to terrorism, and, um, and one day um, there was 102 babies that were born uh, from people who had died in the attacks. So the magazine Vanity Fair brought those babies together and made a, the photograph. And I met some of those mothers, and everyone's question was like, how are we going to provide hope to our children, for ourselves? You know, it was, they, they had lost hope, which is exactly what, you know, terrorism is seeking, right? Um, and so I thought about that, and I was like, okay, well, you know, as a journalist, I think that is the main question today. How do you provide hope, right? And also, how do you, why? It's because if you do that, you may start creating uh, like a counter-narrative to the ones that are destroying our world. So I thought about it and I was like, okay, I, I want to I search for hope in the world, but where do I start and where do I go? Um, and I, it was just by instinct that I, I, I think I should report on women. It was just an instinct. But I was lucky because there's a magazine called Glamour magazine, which is a very like fashion that I've never in my life, but they were interested in covering women. So they sent me in 18 different countries, and, a, and I did a book, I wrote a book about 18 women, and they go from um, a cleaning lady to a president. The president is the president of Liberia, first woman you know, elected in Africa, but the cleaning lady uh, is actually my favorite story in the book, and I'll tell you like very quickly because I, I will explain a little bit why I have so much faith in so-called ordinary women. So this, this lady was a Moroccan lady living in France, and you know she she wanted she she had this really infatu you know, she was infatuated with literature when she was a kid, but like many other girls, you know at that time she was sent to France, married to someone who turned out to be violent couldn't go to school, and started working as a cleaning lady. And she couldn't write or read because she had gone out of school, but what she did, because she had this voice inside her, was to write phonetically, you know, poems. And she would sit, I went to her house, so she would sit in the kitchen, and you could see, there was a little window, and you could see the moon. And so she wrote up this book called Prayer to the Moon, and she talks about being invisible. You know, I, she, she talks about, I live in France, and I'm sure like a lot of people are going to relate to that, and if not you, your mothers or your grandmothers, you know, I'm doing things, I'm, you know, I'm working, I'm helping people, no one sees me. I'm transparent, I'm invisible, you know, and then, so that, and so she wrote her book and poems and poems, and then one day, she had an accident, met a psychologist, and she talked, you know, she said, well, I've been writing this book. So the, the psychologist took the book, transcribed it in French, and the book, you know, long story short, becomes this bestseller, you know, among so many other women in Europe who have been living the same experience. The thing is, no one ever talked about it, you know? So if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. Fatima wrote because it just came out of her, and, you know, and actually um, at the last Cannes Festival, there was a film about her. So, you know, five years later, I wrote about her about seven years ago, and now I see her, like, you know, in the, the red carpet in Cannes, and I'm like, okay, this is what we need so much. So, um, I, I tell you this story to, to, to explain how, what shapes my, my belief in this kind of women, because someone like her, because of what she's experienced, she's, um, she's not susceptible to manipulation, right? Because of her um, voice because she's found a voice, right? So after I did this um, 18 profiles, um, this, is, this was, you know, like, okay, uh, Muslim woman in the suburbs of France, but then I did 18, so I went to the North Pole, I went to Uganda, I went to Colombia, I went to everywhere, and regardless of religion, regardless of social status, regardless of color, um, 
I found the same strength in women, you know? And my choice of women were women who stood up alone, so no one told them what to do. They just acted on a very profound sense of justice, right? And when they have that, then in, they're unstoppable. And I can't tell you all about the stories, but I mean, the, the common thread between all those stories is that no one told them what to do, and that they have changed the lives of millions, well, thousands and thousands of people sometimes, you know. I can't tell you all the stories, but they all have the, that in common. And that all of those, except for Madam President, are so-called ordinary women. So that what, that's what brought me to think about, you know, what they call women's issues. We'll talk about that a bit later. But especially women narrative, you know, because then I started thinking, okay, so if you don't talk about it, it doesn't exist, right? And then I thought about my mom and, you know, all the moms and all that, and I was like, wow, you know, they've, like, my mom went through the Cuban Revolution, you know, my father, I mean, my grandmother went through the Holocaust. We don't know. Like, they never had a, a chance to make sense of what happened and contribute to changing the world. So why is, then I realized that, you know, the, the women narrative, like women access to public space, to power, why is it so controlled everywhere and since the beginning of times, you know? Um, so I asked the question to a lot of people and so the only explanation I had so far, <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not true, but it would be, you know, that yes, of course, we can carry life, therefore we have that power. That's the, the explanation I got, no? And so since the beginning of time, you know, the problem was like to keep women um, Mm, controlled, controlled, right? Maybe that's it, I don't know, but I don't have an explanation for, if I go to Uganda, you know, they tell me a story of why they should cut women, you know, marry them young. If I go to Saudi Arabia, they give me a story of why, you know, women shouldn't ride a bicycle, uh, and etc. So it's all a question of narrative, and behind that narrative, is, it's a question of power, right? So. We're going to show you now uh, a film that we did in Iraq. Joe and I are, um, you know, are doing this effort that, because I, I believed in that so much, in this narrative. Why? It's because uh, all across, you know, again, you know, race, religion, etc., context, all these women that I saw who suffered a lot, all of them, a lot, had no, had somehow overcome already the revenge the thirst for power, all they were interested in is how do we change the world so that doesn't happen. And so when you see that everywhere, regardless of context, you're like, why aren't we capitalizing on this? This is what we need, because at the same time, what's occupying the airwaves is, you know, all kinds of different narratives, right? So, so I, I'm doing that not so much to defend women, but to try to, you know, do my part in trying to save the world from itself. We need to change the narrative. Um, so I'm going to show you a film now. We, it's like a, a short document. Well, it's not actually. It's a 15 minutes uh, documentary, 17 minutes documentary we did in Iraq to illustrate exactly that. Now, the situation there, uh, it's in Erbil, in Kurdistan. And the women we're going to see now are Yazidi refugees. So think about it. It's like they are like the... Okay, so they are victims of ISIS, you know, because they're Christian and there's some Yazidi and all that. But then, in Iraqi society, there are minorities, right? And within their own community, they're women. So they are kind of the bottom of, like, whoever is going to be able to say something. And do you think these women have something to say? Right? So, enough said. You're going to uh, we'll watch the film and then we can talk. In the north of Iraq lives a people that only counts for 1% of the population. They are the Yazidis, an ancient community that, like many others here, has been persecuted forever. In fact, they have suffered 72 genocides so far, and this would be number 73. Sayyidina. 
رجاء اخوان سيد النائب الان هناك حمله سي... اباده جماعيه على المكون اليزيدي اتكلم هنا باسم الانسانيه انقذونا انقذونا نذبح نبيت يباد دين كامل على وجه الارض عيد الرئيس اريد شكرا جزيلا شكرا جناب Yandakil desperate cry for help happened two days after Daesh or ISIS entered Sinjar, when 200,000 people, mostly Yazidis, just fled to the mountains. It's never happened in history. I can't recall a time when thousands and thousands of people were trapped on a mountain with no way out, no food, no water, and it's hard for people around the world to actually imagine that something like this can happen. A lot is being said about those joining the jihad in the region, but people like Taban are quietly doing the opposite. Taban is Kurdish. She left a high-income financial job in London to come and help those hurt by Daesh. It happened on a one-day notice. And on my second day, I went on one of the helicopter aid missions. When the helicopter gets close enough to the ground, everyone just scrambled on and you couldn't stop it. And they just wanted to live when they went on that helicopter. They hadn't had food for days, they hadn't had water for days. They were trapped and it was one of the hottest summers here. 45 degrees, sun exposed. You could tell that everyone was just scrambling on to live. I think slowly people will just become immune to the news and it will just be news. I think it's more the personal stories and actually the experiences of people that will make people connect to what's going on. This is why we put together this journalism and storytelling workshop in Erbil to connect. Because what if given the chance and education Given the skills and confidence, these girls could become powerful voices as well. It's for the first time for me in all my life to have a chance to spread my idea along the whole world and have a chance to make everybody hear me. I lost my job, I lost my house, I lost my family, 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 I lost my family. بس اضطرينا نتركه ونعوفه بعيد وحلمي راح حلمي بالتخرج حلمي بالزواج Christians and Yazidi together everyone here escaped Daesh a few hours before they entered Sinjar What we really want to do is share these stories with other people all over the world. This is the first time in history that women that had never talked before, you know, start speaking. And the world is listening more and more. During a week, we taught them basic journalism skills. Their emerging voices started to weave a powerful counter-narrative. The girls talk a lot about their homes. They're very, very, very rooted in their tradition, in their families. Now in Erbil, you know, it's, it's a refugee situation, so it's really a rip-off of your identity, of who you are, and you have to rebuild that. <laughs> واستغرق بناءه تقريبا عشر سنوات فغادرناها يعني طلعنا من عدها العصر خوفا من دخول داعش لنا وجينا هنا وصلنا الأربيل ساعة تقريبا ثلاثة الفجر بس ما نعرف وين نروح أكيد أكيد انتصار على الواقع اللي صار إلي اللي تهجرت آني من بيتي يعني شيء قوي اقرا تحت القصف 
تحت المدفعيات وكنت اسمعهم كنت اقرا الى ان اجى الى ان ماتوا مدينتي ماتوا ولدين وبنت فطلعنا من من قرقوش ورحنا لاربيل ف سويت امتحان وطلعت معدل 98 وقبلوني بكليه الطب واللي هسه اداوم بها بكركوك My story will be about my great auntie She's the aunt mountain I'm fighting with the with the knights She fighting with the ice come when they need her to fight she was before the man take the gun and go to fight ISIS and when some one of the youth uh, feel uh, weak or, or feel uh, scared she go to them no we need to fight so you have to be strong <laughs> No, it's available on the Time for Change platform, which I'll show you. So uh, you, you have a reference to to the film. Um, we'll give you the yeah yeah because I'll show you uh, Chime after after that. But so anyways, this film like you know these these girls start talking and obviously you know when they when they start talking, of course all their lives and all uh, their uh, family life is like a living page of history. They've lived it. You know, so of course, um, what they have to, you know, what you realize is that women, especially who have never spoken before, um, have a, things that are very interesting for journalists, you know, which is access, which is uh, no, uh, insider knowledge, you know, the codes to understand a situation and how to change it, right? Um, so when I saw like all this, and it's true in, in different countries and it's true in different settings, I started thinking of like, okay, what, what is cutting the narrative today from women, you know? And when you look at it, there's three things. There's uh, religion, there is uh, traditions, and norms, societal norms, right? None of them need justification, right? Uh, if God tells you you should be covered, then you should be covered. Uh, if women are not allowed to drive a bike. Do, you don't need to justify any of uh, the elements that are keeping women's voices down, right? So it's not a, a matter of debate. It just is like that, right? I think this needs to change, you know? And today, we went until 2016, and you know, a lot has been done in the last 20 years, more than probably many centuries combined, but today, nowadays still, when we talk about women's issue, people think about you know, sort of the visible part of the iceberg, but look at it, it's like, we're still cutting women so that they don't have pleasure later in life and don't risk cheating on their husband. We're still marrying kids at nine years old. We're still taking them out of school so they don't have education, therefore they're powerless for life, right? And there's more that we don't even know about, like I'm gonna give you an example. Who knows about the practice of um, breast ironing? No one, right? So that's happening all over West Africa, where young girls have their breast ironed so that they don't grow and don't attract men. I mean, you, you see how crazy it is? <laughs> it's crazy. And we, and, and, and there's no, like if you start rationalizing, it's like, what? What? Can't you keep it in your pants instead? You know what I mean? It's like, they'd rather, you do something which is obviously very damageable for the, for the girls. You know, the girls do not grow normally after that. You know, you're not supposed to iron people's breasts, right? So you're going to ruin their, their health, you're going to ruin, you know, their, their lives just so that the men that are going to cross them are not going to rape them? So it doesn't make any sense. You know, and I think that you know it's time to like you know build this counter narrative. You know, and I think it's interesting doing it in women because, you know, at the end of the day, you see that you know every everything that we talk about in this forum and all forums all over the world, at the end of the day, it's always about distribution of power, always, right? So I think that, you know, what's interesting in women is that my feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, and I hope not, but because of all the, it's, they're sort of expert in justice, women, no? When, when you go through all these you know, problems, you sort of know them really well. And I feel like um, 
you know, when women start talking, and it's happening more and more, I'm going to give you some examples right now, it's happening more and more that the women like Fatima, ordinary women, are standing up for the rights of everybody else. What happens then? Violence against them, right? Which is really important uh, because you know, that, this is the way we get women down before. You, you talk too much, you die, basically, you know? But now it's different because we have the internet, because we have social media. So, for instance, you know, I did a story about a girl who's 13 years old. She's in some village in, in, uh, in Kenya, and she managed to contact me, and she said, I am locked in my room, you know, I, they don't want me to go to school unless they let, you know, I, I go through a uh, female... Uh, genital mutilation. What do I do? You know, so obviously, uh, you know, it was a problem, you know, for me, but mostly it's like this kid, you know, is alone. She's locked in her room in her parents' house and her parents would not, you know, take her to school if she doesn't do that for their own sake or for their, but she won't, you know, she won't and she's only 13. So I'm seeing that happening all over the world. You know, of course the media doesn't report on it. The media is about, also about power. Everything is about power. So I don't think that the media is going to, you know, the media is going to follow. It's going to follow you, not the other way around, right? So when, you know, um, somehow, because no one has really questioned those narratives, you know, we just keep going as if they were very normal. And we talk about women, oh God, like in, in, in the Congo, for instance, you know, I just, I went to last year to a conference in London and, and rape is used as a weapon of war. It's a systematic rape of women as a weapon of war. So this, you know, has to change. And um, uh, I, I think what's really interesting is that Probably because, I don't know if it's, you know, is it the time, like, you know, at some point in, in South Africa, apartheid, you know, the apartheid was over because the time had come. I think that the time had come with women, but it all relies on everyone taking the stock and realizing, you know, okay, well, so that change is not going to come from a politician, it's not going to come from the media, it's not going to come from my, you know, um, from anybody else than, than, than myself. And what does that mean for me in my context, you know? The thing is, you know, like every genuine, very strong movement, usually on, on your own, you know? And so I think the two aspects are there. Yeah, you are on your own because you have to confront your society. But on the other hand, you're not. And so the platform I work for, it's called Time for Change. And uh, it shows, I think, a little bit that, you know, the world is like awakening to this, you know, to this new situation because because people are coming together to help women, you know, and Trying for Change is a good example of that. Can we have uh, the, the visual? Um, it's a good example of that because I'm the only journalist in there, you know, but the rest is, like, so it's founded by a fashion brand, Gucci. It's, you know, founded by uh, Beyonce, mm, Salma Hayek. We have the Bill Gates Foundation as a partner. We have Facebook as a partner. So every time we do something, you know, we are able more and more to um, support uh, the, the, the efforts of women. So one part of the platform is crowdfunding to support those kind of uh, initi initi initiatives, no? And the other part is storytelling. And I try in the storytelling platform to, to have people speak first person. I, I, you know, uh, it's not about opinion. I mean, it's, it is about opinion, but I think that um, through connection, through like, you know, people start understanding more and more and more. And you start seeing also that how much women have to say that has the power to sort of, you know, bring a new narrative to the world, which we really need. Uh, my experience and my, you know, conclusion is that very, you know, I mean, almost no one, you know, can say that they have the character to resist power, especially when they have it, no? No one can say that. It's one of the most tricky thing in the world. And if, we, if it wasn't, you know, we wouldn't have so much, you know, despots or, or, or ISIS or, or, you know, or greed or corruption. That's where it comes from, you know. And if we don't change the human heart, so basically what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we've had so many different revolutions. You know, we've had political revolutions, we've had technological, we have industrial, we have everything but the human revolution. And that, you know, human revolution lies in what we call soft power, which, you know, I think is much more powerful than, you know, usually caricature, you know, that's how we keep women down is violence, all type of violence, moral violence, physical violence, you know, 
the obsession to control the, the female body and all that, right? But I think that, you know, things are happening now that are not under the control, neither the media, neither the politicians, it's a civil society. And that's what's the most interesting to me. Can we have? Did, did, did people not understand the video? You understand? Well, it's hard to summarize, but it makes, I'll give you the link after you can look it on, online, but it's hard to summarize. But this is not the one, huh? uh, This is not the one. After well, brainstorming a few ideas, I decided that my spoken word piece should be about. Uh, anyways, no, I'm gonna give you another example. It's, an, it's a black girl, yeah. Um, so why, um, you know, why curate the voice of, of women, you know? Uh, I'm not satisfied the way we uh, still cover women in the media. You know, I feel like, you know, women are mostly, uh, okay, we have a lot of statistics. For instance, about uh, abortion. <laughs> My mentor it? is Kathleen. About Charlie. abortion. Um, whenever I feel overwhelmed, I write a letter to it? rap. Uh, um, the quotes in America, I think, uh, about abortions, 85% of the quotes come from men, you know? That's just one, one statistic, right? So something is not right, and the change has to come from, from, from people who at the time and now have no power, so they don't have to deal with that, <laughs> you know? Because that's the only way we're going to show a way of being in the world that's, um, that's not based on, on control and power, right? So I want, to, I want to show you, I mean, there's a lot of stories on Shine, but uh, it, I hope you speak English because she speaks quite fast, but I want to show you an example of, this is a kid in Harlem, uh, she's 18 years old, and you know, I mean, if you see the coverage of, you know, black, obviously there's a lot of people, um, a lot of problems with black people in America, but who really knows what's going on? No one, right? So this girl is a girl from Harlem. She went to a program that is to help her find that voice, right? And that's what she wrote, so she reads it. I'll let, I'll let you. Uh... Hi, I'm Danny Green. <laughs> My mentor is Kathleen Shiner. Um, whenever I feel overwhelmed, I write a letter to rapper Kanye West, telling him my situation. <laughs> this is the first letter I wrote to him this year. The title is Dear Kanye, January 14th. Dear Kanye, January 14, 2012, 7.45 p.m. Nine days ago, I called the financial aid office of every college I applied to, told them I had to submit my FAFSA without parental information, told them Sean, the man I don't call daddy and who has only ever been 23 chromosomes won't give his information, raises his voice to shout like Otis Day, hurls your stupid from the bottom of his throat every time my mom and I try. Each college said my parents are married, and the boy I refuse to call daddy lives in the house so they can't help me. Said I was in a tough situation like I didn't know, and like I don't see the lives of the people I live with and how content like a snake has opened its mouth and swallowed their lives whole. My brother Robert is jobless, almost 30, has an associate's degree and no direction. My sister Jessica is sleeping with the man she loves and isn't her husband. She just got laid off, has four children, and no more food stamps. My brother Darius has made a house out of my grandfather's room to avoid everything that's on the outside of his door. My younger brother, Philip, has taken the geometry regions three times, smokes weed, and wonders what he'll do with his life. My mother, had she gone to UCLA, would be a doctor right now. The closest Aunt Carla has gotten to being an actress is flipping the pages of her celebrity tabloids looking for herself. My family has redefined happiness to make their lives mean something. This isn't about college, Kanye. This is about being here. I don't mean here in Brooklyn. I mean here, this place where dead dreams lurk in the footprints of everyone you're close to, where your future stares at you through the eyes of a parent. It looks like a husband I don't love 
an affair to revive what's in my coffin chest, a job that reminds me of what I never achieved, a checking account with the zero balance and children whose faces Let's ask what's for dinner. <laughs> and she goes on and she speaks very fast, so I don't know. But, you know, once you, when you listen to her, all of a sudden, what, you know, you can understand really what she's going through. You know, all of a sudden it becomes human, becomes carnal. You know, and if we don't have that connection, how are we going to ever understand or change the situation, right? So, in order for us to be, you know, full rights citizens, and in order to, for us to contribute to this world, and it's not about, you know, for me, like, it's not about women against men, for sure, um, and it's also not about feminism. It's really about how we're going to save, you know, the world from itself. And I, you know, from what I've experienced, across cultures and across uh, religion and across everything, that power that women have you know, built slowly, 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 you know, is exactly the one we need, need now. And, and the world is not going to accept that easily, for sure. For sure, you know, it's like, and this is not only about the developing world, by the way, you know, the, um, with the stories we do is, you know, as well about America and as, as well about France and about, you know, everything. It's, it's the same, um, it's the same pattern everywhere, no? So, um, on Trying for Change, we, you know, I, I, uh, I, I put examples, you know, I'm trying to like help people connect. So, so for instance, I have this, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to show you a couple of examples. One is, for instance, um, uh, um, the story of a waste picker in India, you know, she picks up waste, you know, but she's such an amazing woman that somehow she's like, you know, helped people in her community, to, you know, do their job well, etc. Long story short, the trade unions of waste picker come to see her and realize that she knows everything they don't know because she's been 20 years picking up the garbage, right? And they have a big problem with climate change and they don't know what to do. But she knows because she knows, she knows how the garbage is, you know, is recycled and all of that. So they come to her and, and now she's like traveling all over the world and going to the UN, you know, and talking about climate change because at some point we need solutions and we need the people who know the solutions. Another example I was going to show you, we don't have, uh, sadly, no, we don't have anything. Uh, was um, uh, a girl from Saudi Arabia who, uh, who she says uh, in her article, she says, I had the, the, I'm both fortunate and very unfortunate to have fallen in love with uh, climbing, high altitude climbing, right? This woman, she's a girl in Saudi Arabia. You can ride a bike or you can ride a car in Saudi Arabia. So she had to convince her dad that she wanted to, to she did it, you know? She did it, and her, in her story, she, twice she, she climbed the Mount Everest because she had no right to go to a gym or whatever, you know, she went on the internet and, you know, and learned how to train on the internet, right? And she talks about how the mountain really was her dad because to change is, you know, thinking around that I can do that and, and I'm not, you know, a, a disrespectable person for it, you know? Changing mentality is the hardest and that's why we do pretty well. You know, so we can see her, no? The, the, the Saudi climber, or no, we don't have any sort of, so sorry about that. I, I also not, no, no. Okay, what time is it? Do we have uh... Oh, so we're almost done. I've talked so much. <laughs> I also was going to show you a lot of videos and stuff. So um, I want to show you one now because, okay, so that's the situation. Now, how do we change mentality? Um, you know, it's, it's, when you go into, um, it's again a question of power, you know, people who have power have no reason not to, to let go of it, unless they have a lot of, um, you know, they're very noble or they're very, you know, they're very developed as human beings, I would say, you know, but usually they don't, and usually they don't let go of it. So, you know, women have to find a way to challenge that in a way that's uh, productive. And it's, pos it's possible. I'm going to show you an example of uh, a man in India. Well, he's going to talk for himself. I'll let you uh, Can we see that? <laughs> I want you to know my path of becoming a man led to pain, sometimes violence, and destruction. When I look at my childhood, I see that was full of masculine attitudes. I was not taught to respect women. I found it very natural. My friend said that she loves you and you must marry her. I thought that I'm doing some favor to her 
being a man, great man. So I always had reasons to get angry with her. I remember when I struck her. I remember driving her out of the house and kicking her. How could I have ever done something like this? <sighs> I was all the time very anxious. I mean, I, I, I absolutely had no patience telling her every time how incapable she is. I used to destroy her, her dignity, her self-respect by using emotional violence. Finally, it led to another divorce. I have deserted her not just in terms of matrimony, but I also know that her soul is all alone. My third marriage was also on the rocks and probably it would have gone the same way as the earlier marriages. Uh, just as arrogant and as violent as anybody could be. But my wife, she insisted that I go and do a gender training workshop. That was all the first time that I was shaken. Why am I behaving this way all the time? Why there is so much distraction? Slowly, I started realizing that I can be more constructive, I can be more creative with my wife by changing my attitudes. Every day, I have to get rid of my masculinity concept. I think this same viewpoint is seen everywhere and I see as the root of so much distraction in the world. Courageous man, he was courageous. You know, it takes a lot of guts for someone to admit something like that, to change his behavior, but it's possible, you know. Uh, and that's what we, we're aiming at because, you know, Ravindra is a much happier man today, <laughs> having, you know, he himself wasn't even, you know, aware of the narrative that, that kept him violent against his wives and, and for nothing. There was no, you know, there was no reason for justification. This lady, you know, managed to bring him, you know, it took him 50 years to change the way he thought, but that's, that's what happens and that's what we need to do. Um, so anyway, to uh, conclude, I mean, do you have any questions? Do you want to ask questions or? Come on, ask questions. Come on, wake up. <laughs> any questions, anyone? Yes. She's going to give you a mic so we can hear you. Well, I'll tell you again. <laughs> Thank you for your And uh, it's also very interesting to see how women around the world live. And uh, my name is Ayman from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we know well that, for example, in countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan, there are so many women who, who are not able to educate, to have education. And it's, it's, it's very crucial to have education. For instance, in, in Kazakhstan, yeah. uh, men who are, get married to, for example, to girls, to women, uh, they decided in advance that she will work. It's very important, mm. particularly for men now. It's not in terms of um, financial part, but in terms of have like mutual interest to each other. Right. Because when you don't have education, you don't read anything or you're not interested in the world. You're not an interesting person. Right. You're just cooking, you're like a cooking machine. It's important to have education first, to have like opportunity to work for women. And uh, first of all, I think the world should think about providing education for this woman, for young women who live in this, those countries, and then they become more interesting to their men. And nobody will, like, um, cr uh, cruel to you, like, particularly your husband, because he respects you, not for just his wife, just for women and for a person individually. Yeah, it's in Pakistan, important. in fact, you know, um, 
There is a, you should see, watch on, on Chime. So Chime has all these stories, and you, you'll be able to see it. We'll give you the link. But there's a very interesting story uh, um, of a girl called Umaira. And, <clears throat> you know, keeping women out of the school, it's, it's, it's a way to, like, you know, condemn them for life, you know, to work as, as a dependent person, no? Uh, so, so that, you know, that work to bring girls to school, that's a really worldwide effort. But you should watch a film that's there, it's called Umaira, and she, she's a young girl who's determined to bring girls to school in Pakistan. And you see her going, actually the, the, the film um, won the Academy Award, uh, but you see her going to this assembly of men and trying to explain to them why the girls should go to school. It's very illuminating because you start understanding how they think. And you say, oh my God, but they are ignorant. So how do we do that? You know? And I, I think understanding all these levels is, is really important. You know, it's not enough to say like, we should, we should, you know? In Pakistan, like the first stories we, I published on Chime was about a mother of a, of a jihadist who went all, in all the provinces to meet the mothers of, to be jihadists, to convince them not to bring them. No one ever spoke about that. She's been doing that for 20 years. Do you understand? So it's not only, so there's different levels. Yeah, bring girls to school, then shift the media, shift the mentality. So it's a lot of work. And in a way, it's not our, it shouldn't be our job because you'll, you'll be like, why don't we blame the victims? Why should we do that when we are there? But that's, that's because we have the, you know, that's, that's what we do. And so all of that, in some ways, is gonna be, you know, for me, like when I saw this video that I'm gonna show you now, it basically summarizes everything I told you in like two minutes. <laughs> so, yes, yes. So, well, just watch it as a, as a, as a way to finish it, but. It's beautiful. I mean, I think, but I think you know, it's, it says, you know, what you, in the midst of this noise and its opinions and everybody, you know, trying to be right and imposing their views. Where's the voice? Where's the human voice? And that's what she symbolizes for me. Voila! I hope I managed to convince at least one of you. <laughs> and uh, voila. I wanted to express my opinion on two aspects. First of all, in Kazakhstan, from the very beginning, we have national traditions that a girl, a woman, is like a flower. And we were in Soviet times, that is why such um, things that suppress uh, women's uh, freedom do not exist in modern Kazakhstan. But what you have shown us today is very urgent today because we are living in the world of globalization. But because I'm responsible for this uh, problem, narrative, media narrative, I just wanted to ask this question. And I also were in, uh, I was in Mokihari on the topic of problems of Central Asia countries, what do you think? What's the difference between media narrative, which is developed uh, today, uh, and ordinary narrative, the narrative of literature that was used in literature? Probably there are some specific techniques. 
which differentiates um, media narrative today? Absolutely, that's a really good question. I think that, um, yeah, the, that, what I was saying before, I don't think the media is going to anticipate anything. You know, I think this is going to come from you guys. You know, and they'll, they'll follow you. So the, the, the narrative, like broadly, you know, without giving you too many technical information, broadly, we're not in the media. You know, there's a lot of women reporters, but as sources, you know, I think we're 20% globally you know, as uh, experts as well, you know. I mean, what I told you, you know, in, in the little society like the Yazidi in Iraq is, you know, it's, you can make a parallel to what's happening in the media, right? So this is why my particular effort is actually to work on narrative, meaning that um, uh, I want to bring storytelling, you know, um, uh, just technical narrative and, uh, to, to women so that they can tell their own stories in, in, in the way that you know, they feel it's complete and right. If someone else tells your story, you always have the chance that you know, they'll get it wrong or they'll use it for their own purpose. And that's what's happening in the media. You know, when they talk to women, it's like, how much have you suffered? Did you cry? You know, did it hurt? That's what they want, right? So it's our job, even though you know, maybe it shouldn't be, but it is, to, to, to transform that. So I believe that now it comes the time to quality you know, quality storytelling for women, quality narrative, because that's how we're gonna capture, you know, people's attention and people understanding. So, indeed, yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. I've been in concerts in London, uh, right. Chime for Change, and um, i really interested in all the messages, all celebrities told, but don't you think that uh, using celebrities as the voice speakers, sometimes it's overrated and we, maybe we impose so many for, for them, but, but it doesn't work. I think it's a double-edged sword, you're right, because, I mean, you know, my take on that, like one day I was in London, <laughs> it was so funny because I was like with two really hardcore feminists, you know, really, and that, those are tough and scary. <laughs> And, you know, and they were sort of like battling with me because they say, you know, how can you, you know, say you're a feminist and Beyonce and that's where she... My take, you know, is very simple. It's like, considering the situation, we can use all the help that we can have, you know. And I told them, it's like, if you live in a world where you can afford, you know, not using this kind of power to help women, then that's not my world, right? Basically, that's that. It is the reality of the world. Beyonce, I mean, I saw her in action. She takes one tweet and it goes 25 million people in like an hour. That's the reality of our work, so of our, of our world, you know? Then you can always like argue, is she feminist, not feminist? Ah, who cares? She's helping, and she's helping in her capacity. I'm helping in my capacity. And that's, I think that's what's important now. And women are very good at that. Women like to, I mean, I've seen that. They like to work together. They like to, to help each other. And I feel that at this stage, Unless if it's for manipulation, you know, we, can, we use all the help we can, you know, and, and, and Beyonce in her capacity as a star, you know, helps. Look at this kid, she's writing to Kanye West for Christ's sake, you know what I mean? She's writing to Kanye West, fine, she's 18 years old, she's an American kid, that doesn't matter, it's, you know. So that's, that's my take on it, like we can't afford to be snobby about help. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a student of Eurasian National University. Uh, and I want to say that uh, your work is perfect, that you uh, give women new brands, like voice. Uh, and my question is, uh, to, uh, in our Kazakh nation, we have one tradition. Uh, it is named Amin Gerlek. It's tradition uh, in the past, but it was, it is in the past. Uh, it was uh, many uh, like killings and uh, it was strange time and um, uh, sometimes uh, husbands or husbands were died. And uh, after his dying, uh, their uh, wives uh, like uh, be, uh, being like uh, give to uh, the brothers, yeah. like uh, mm. yes, the brothers. And uh, I want to know uh, about your opinion. Uh, uh, it is like two sides of this uh, tradition. It is like tradition. And I want to know about your opinion. 
Well, my opinion is like, you know, that's what I said at the beginning, like, you know, in order to do what we do to women, we need a narrative, right? And the narratives come, it turns that in women's case, the narrative doesn't need a justification because they just have to tell you that's the tradition and that's it, you know? And I don't know if people say like, you know, well, I just don't agree with this tradition, but you know, that you're enforced, right? So you don't need a justification. Honor killings, you know, it happens all over the world. Cousin A, you know, fight with cousin B, then cousin A is gonna kill the sister of cousin B. I mean, that's what's happening, right? So if you look about it, like in a, in a very like, you know, cold, uh, with cold eyes, and it, just, it makes no sense at all, you know? So I think without, probably, I mean, I think women have the capacity of questioning this tradition without, uh, without attacking it, you know? Because it's like Ravindra. You know, he's, a, he's ignorant. He was ignorant, right? He was beating his wife because he thought he could, and he should, or whatever. You know, so it is this type of education that we need to do. You know, maybe like men think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm protecting my girl by 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 marrying her at nine years old. But that's what's happening. You know, they're doing all these things so that they don't get raped or they don't attract the eye of a man. So this, this is absolutely crazy when you look when you think about it it makes no sense right so traditions you know there's there's plenty of really great amazing traditions and there's plenty of harmful tradition there's no reason in 2016 to apply traditions that were you know look at isis you know are we going to go back to the middle age it's like this is it you know i mean there's the one on the one hand there's that and the one hand there's the other one so this is how important this is <laughs> well thank you very much everyone Yes. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties here. Um, we have put the Time for Change website address on the screen. So if anyone does want to write it down, you can find the, many of the stories that we tried to show you. Um, and you can find many, many more as well. And you can do stories. You can write stories for us as well. Right. So, so you can have a look. And there's information on Time for Change about contributing and you know, getting in touch with Marianne. Also, um, the technical problem has been fixed and there still is a bit of time, so even though we'll finish, and I know most people have to go, we'll play the end of the movie, but feel free to leave, but if anyone does want to see it, um, it it's working now. <laughs> yeah. and, and just finally to say, um, it's been such a nice time to come to the Eurasia Media Forum and I'm really pleased to see that they have worked these master classes now. And, um, Marianne and I have been speaking to people today and we'll continue to speak and we're hoping that maybe someday we can come back to Kazakhstan and run a workshop, a women's storytelling workshop for women in Kazakhstan or maybe a journalist training workshop for women journalists. So I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here and apologize for that. Hello everyone. Thank you for uh, very interesting information about your foundation. My question is, well, first of all, my comment is that, well, my empirical observation is that, well, feminicide maybe was happening since the very first days of the humanity. That's my personal observation. Well, I mean, like you, can, you, you know from the history that beautiful and smart women were accused, you know, in being uh, like witches, uh, wizards, I don't know. Well, uh, they were, you know, punished, executed, yeah. Uh, but you know, it's pretty, well, it's a male world. Let's put it this way, yeah? It's still a male, the male world, the male world. So, uh, Kazakhstan is a Asian country. Well, yeah, we are part of the globalization. The paradigm is being changed here. But whenever we start talking about uh, improving our rights, uh, my feeling is that men see some kind of uh, threat to them. Well, like, uh, yeah, you, are, you want to be more empowered, but, but why? What for? You want to disentitle us? Like, when you talk about empowerment of someone, you might mean disentitlement of someone, yeah? Who is on the opposite side. So, um, what, would you, what would you advise? What, your, what tips you can give uh, to us, women of Kazakhstan, in this case? How to, uh, well, persuade, I don't know, how to... Uh, sell this model or convince our yeah. men that we are progress agents like like they are that we are trying to uh, you know 
get progress, you know, for our kids, for our future, how to build that dialogue, productive, constructive dialogue. Thank you. I think that, you know, this is the same problem that uh, women have all over the world, and somehow it's not, you know, it's not only, you know, in one region or one continent. It's, 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 still, it's still true in America, I'm trying to say. It's still true in the West, in France, everywhere. In some ways, the resistance you're meeting shows you how important your work is, you know? Because if you didn't, then there's not, nothing's going on. People who hold, hold power, you know, even if it's a, you know, the power that Ravindra was talking about, meaning I can, you know, beat my wife and abuse her and nothing's gonna happen, right? To change mentalities, and especially for people who have no reason to change, you know, because they're quite comfortable in a way, you know, dominating, you know, dominating women. Yeah, there's no reason. So, th so therefore, you know, we're gonna have, we're gonna need that soft power. We're gonna need that intelligence. You know, we're gonna need that um, capacity of thinking and analyzing situation and 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 patience and all of those qualities that tend to be more feminine. I don't think it's a man and women, but I did, I do see that a lot in women, because the point is not to, I mean, if. You know that if you, if you go against, you, you get a backlash, you know? But yeah, it means that we're gonna have to work twice harder, twice, that's just what it is. It's gonna be like that. But I think women are, are willing to do that now, you know? And I think that, you know, they're not necessarily isolated anymore, you know? Because if we publish like, a, you know, a story, like you do something and you write a story for us, and it goes on, on the platform like Chime, then all of a sudden, you know, how many women can relate to you? You know, this is Kazakhstan, but like, you know, same thing happens there and then so many women, and then you become stronger. And I think that this is something that women have, is the, the will to network. I'm not saying that all women are great and, you know, and able to resist power. This is not a general thing, it's just an observation. But the, the networking and the help, you know, that you can get from through platforms like that is very important because you know, the main way to stop women, you know, is, is keep them in national borders, you know, because then it's, it's enough that the media is not going to cover you. You, don't, you know, you don't exist. You don't say it doesn't exist, or the issue is gone. And that's, that's been the strategy. And that's changing because now we do have social media. We do have people we can talk to, you know, and so we have to make use of that. And you're right, you know, Kazakhstan is part of the world, <laughs> you know, and so it's engaged in the same battle. Thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting uh, conversation. And my question is, uh, do you think that we, the media society, communicators and journalists, should strive to create different content and try to use different storytelling techniques for men and for women to try uh, and encourage them to think uh, from a fresh perspective or to think differently about gender roles? Or do you think that the same storytelling techniques could work for both men and women? For example, that man that we just talked about, um, do you think that he, um, that the type of content that he, that he consumed was different than the one that usually encourages women to think different about, different about gender roles? So what do you think about that? Well, I think that a good story is a good story. That's it, you know? And um, the, the narrative about women, that is why we need from women, you know, because I'm kind of tired to hear about women, you know. I, I'd rather hear directly from people. So I think in terms of journalism, um, you know, the, the one thing about journalists is they hate questioning themselves, you know. They also have power. They also have to deal with power. There's also not that many people that can do it, right? And so it's always a question of character, you know? So you as a journalist, I mean, I, you know, I think that, you know, especially since 9-11, there's been very, very, very little thinking in the world of journalism, questioning, you know? They don't question themselves, so it's a problem, you know? Therefore, you, we, you need pioneers. You need people who are able to do that, you know, and, 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 and do it and not wait for, for them because they're not going to, you know, they're not going to initiate that. So basically what Joe and I are trying is like, yeah, we want excellent stories and we want quality journalism and we want top because we want to show that, you know, that, you know, that's, that's the next step really, you know. So I think that just in terms of journalism, we should all come back to where are we here for? Serve people? Are we serving people? Just the first three basics of journalism. And, and question ourselves, because they, they don't have to change them, they're very good, and they're still very good today. 
The question is, are we applying that? And that at some point, you know, I know it's complicated in the media, believe me, I, know, I do know it's complicated, I know you're not alone and all that, but it, it still remains, you know, your quality, your character as a journalist, you know, it's, it's, it is your responsibility, sadly. <laughs> As for soft powers about men and women, it's not a secret that wars and revolutions are held by warriors in order to defend more people, more women's bodies. And among, and uh, for example, now in our planet we face with more slavery in the world. Why? Because healthy men and women they uh, went away to Europe, uh, to other countries from Syria, from Libya, and in Syria and in Libya there is a small amount of population and. I have a data from Russian mass media. Seven, eight years old a girl or a boy, and probably younger, they are just uh, sold by uh, princes, by very rich people, and uh, they use them uh, for slaves, like uh, new wives, and so on which is not acceptable in former CIS countries. And uh, can you tell me, please, what to do in order to change the situation? Boys and girls, you are laughing at me, but it's very serious. Why am I talking about it? Because in our world, no wars or revolutions changes the story, the history, but ideas, uh, way of thinking changes the world. And over hundreds of years, you know that um, Quran was changed, and it says about slavery, about uh, women, and uh, the earlier you got married, uh, the better. So what do you think? Uh, should we, like journalists, uh, to reconsider Quran, the Muslims' book? Because it says about uh, slavery, and today we have even robots for sex. And uh, you know that psychologists uh, say that there is a disease uh, connected with different uh, uh, sexual preferences and so on. And uh, what do you think? How can we start softly to reconsider the basics of Quran, Muslims' book, in order not to offend other people, but to change the situation? Well, I think it's going to be hard to apply journalistic rules to the Quran. <laughs> That's going to be difficult. I, my take is, you know, keep religion out of it. You know, when I when I was uh, when I started, I, I told you, I, you know, I was searching for hope for all these people. And my take is like, I don't want hope coming from faith. You know, because that's a very individual thing. So in terms of, you know, the Quran and how it's interpreted. Uh, like you see, uh, you know, with ISIS, when we keep doing the film, you see there's a section where they they give the price. You know, uh, you we sell, uh, you know, a 12 year old for 500. You know, 14 year old, like whatever. You know, they sell people and, you know, rape as a weapon of war in the Congo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, you know, um, those are, I told you, like you know, tradition, religion. You know, and. These stories, they come as, as such, meaning you're not supposed to question the Quran. You're not supposed to question, but it's a matter of interpretation as well, you know. So you, as a, as a believer, you know your relationship to God, you know your relationship to people, and that's all that matters, you know. And what matters is your human behavior. The values that are yours are yours. How do you behave as a human being is what I'm, I'm interested in. So, you know, that's why, like, you know, the... the, the um, uh, people who use sacred books to justify violence and killings are just, you know, taking the narrative and giving it to you and they don't have to justify its religion. Do you understand? So this is why we need to deconstruct these things, you know, doing like, now it's getting into, like everybody wants now has stories and that's what we want to do, you know, because then you start realizing, you know, what's really going on. This question maybe could be, you know, could be, talked about and, and and it's a really good example because because people in this situation use violence you know 
you know, very, very strongly. So how do we deconstruct this narrative? Don't you think we should work with the women that are with these guys? You know, and this is what we need to do. And uh, again, you know, when, when we do look at the situation objectively, you realize that it makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Who are you to tell me that I'm worth, you know, 500, you know, who are you? And how do you behave, you know? And so I think that's, that should be, uh, journalism needs to be neutral, you know, and journalism needs to apply its rules. It has very good rules and very good ethics, you know, and I think it's enough for us to work from, you know, because when you start questioning in a journalistic way, you realize it's absurd, it doesn't make sense. You've got your answer, right? So it's just a matter of power. No more of religion. It's a very interesting platform. The, the story of telling. What is interesting to know how did you develop it? Uh, did you have any investors? How did you attract investors to arrange your trips for storytelling? How would you involve people for storytelling? How would you find authors for narratives for storytellers? Did you pay? any money to them, the support, financial support. Question one. The second question. Now we have a tendency where citizens of Kazakhstan, females, go to slavery, to ISIS. Uh, why does it happen that one woman would fight for freedom to express her voice, but other women, like our our Kazakhstani ladies go in the opposite direction. Why can it happen? And what do you think about this? Uh, I'm not sure I understood your question. <laughs> I'm not sure you understood your question. What, what is your question? Because I think... How did you create your platform? How did you attract investors if you attracted any? How did you attract big companies? Maybe this were your investors because you had to go on business trips. Maybe you uh, attracted journalists from BBC. So, uh, in other words, who sponsors your trip? to go to different countries, to it's talk a, to different uh, storytellers. It's a platform that I'm, I didn't bring all that together. <laughs> I'm just one element. But, you know, that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like, you know, Time for Change shows you that there is something shifting in society in our favor because, you know, Gucci is a big brand, right? It's a big fashion brand. They are the ones who paid for it, right? For the platform, for the concert, for everything, you know? Um, and then they do crowdfunding, and so it shows you that, you know, the big institutions, the powerful institutions are realizing that, you know, this is a century of women and they better, you know, be there. And, and so, so we have support, that's what I was telling her before, you know, it's like now there's an awareness that has never been there before. Right, and and, um, and 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 then we should we should help each other that way. So for me, for instance, the platform, I'm I'm sort of like the the loose bullet in the platform because I I don't um, take care at all at the other side because I'm a journalist, you know. So I only do journalism and storytelling, right? But. I myself, I mean, I've been doing that for 12 years, and it took, you know, time. I've been talking to these guys for maybe four or five years before, you know, someone said, okay, let's do it. Because, and it came from the frustration that, you know, we were not happy about, you know, how women were covered. You know, it was just like, this is not it, you know, and then the media, it wasn't interested in changing that. I mean, the media that I approached wasn't interested in changing that. You know, so therefore, for me as a journalist, it's fantastic to be the only journalist there <laughs> and work with other people because everybody does their bit, you know. And Facebook, what they do well, spread the message, you know. Gucci, what they do well, you know, gather influential people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And, and, and I think that the, f the fact that the world is coming together that way, you know, is a, is a, is a very encouraging sign. And that's how, you know, but darling, I've worked really hard <laughs> in order to do anything for women. Mm. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> anyway, we'll be around for another day and a half, so... يعني شيء اوكي يو كان يا يو كان سي ذا اند اوف ذا فيديو تحت القصف تحت المدفعيات وكنت اسمعهم كنت اقرا الى ان اجى الى ان ماتوا مدينتي ماتوا ولدين وبنت فطلعنا من من قرقوش ورحنا الاربيل ف سويت امتحان وطلعت معدل 98 وقبلوني بكليه الطب واللي هسه اداهم بها بكركوك My story will be about my uh, great auntie. She stay on mountain and fighting with the with the knights. She fighting with the ice come when they need her to fight. She was before the man take the gun and go to fight ISIS. And when some one of the youth uh, feel uh, weak or or feel a scared, she go to them. No, we need to fight. So you have to be strong. 3rd of August, it was the first time I hear her cry. That makes me scared, really. She had a lose of three sons and uh, her husband in one night. She never cried. She said to my mom, I not cry because our youth is dying. I cry for those uh, beautiful girls between those bad guys and they do bad things with them. That makes me cry, really, because they are like a, like a beautiful rose between a bad hands. I want to write a book, this is the basis, a topic, and the topic is also the topic. There is no one who has a goal for this. داعش هناك من كانوا داخلين البرتلة وليش ما طلعتي؟ أنا ظليت شهرين ظليت أنا شهرين وثلاث أيام أبكر مليس ما طلعت ما قدروا أطلع انسبت الطريق ما يعني كانوا يشوفوني كانوا يفوتوني يطلعوني يعني يعني كانوا يطلعوني كم مرة طلبوا منك هالشيء؟ يعني طلبوا مني ثلاث أربع مرات ثلاث أربع مرات بس يعني كسروا تماثيل كسروا التماثيل مال الكنيسة يا كنيسة في العراق في سايت أكتلي وهي سافرت ألات لأنهم لا يحبون تريد أس أس إيراكي بيبل It's uh, something like uh, a person in second or third or fourth degree, not like others, but just because of our religion. Journalism was our ethical backbone, but between religious wars, minority status, and complex geopolitics, I wonder, what does it even mean to speak the truth here? When you are saying truth in Europe or in America, it's something else than you say it here, because here, you will pay for it. Maybe you will pay your life for it. If you criticize the government, so government will consider you their enemy and you are an enemy of democracy. It's easy to accuse others by many things and sometimes, many times, uh, people pay their life to saying truth. Throughout history, Women never got much of a chance to speak their truth. But when they do start sharing their stories, the endless cycle of persecutions comes to life. I was born in Edbilt and stayed here for about four and a half years before um, my family and myself were persecuted by Saddam Hussein. I think for anyone to be captured the way we were, um, put in prison and destined to be buried alive, as a child, you become numb and you watch the adults, but you can see no life in the adults' eyes. Like they don't, they've just given up. I remember seeing it in my mum's eyes.
Thana also comes from a people that suffered ethnic cleansing. They are called the Feilis and are still considered stateless. I was one of the victim. I was six years old when they came in the three o'clock in the morning and I was slept in my grandma's house and they took all of them and left me in house and took all my grandma, my aunties, my uncles and left me in the home alone. No one document this disaster. Even one single minute video, you can't find this. So just like Taban, Thana left her life in London and on her own made it her mission to record those voices within. I took my camera and went, I told them, please, let me document it. I'm really scared. One day, one coming and they said, even the government, you don't know. I said, no, it wasn't like this. It's not true. So I just, okay, let me document it. Let me record it. I'm Iraqi and you know like I'm living in this society. I know how the father, the husband, the brother, the, how they feel. It's just like they've been broken down from inside. But I think we need to supply a lot of attention on the girls. Today, thousands of women and girls are still in the hands of Daesh, being raped systematically and sold as sexual slaves. There was crisis if you are less than 15, and if you are between 12 and 15, more than 15. And you know, people, they are dealing with it at its normal. Be because everything in our life, like Iraqi, it's became normal. Every girl I met her in first week, she was like so happy to just be free. But after that, when I just like her psychology became worse and worse, and all of them, they told me, we can't sleep. Every time we sleep, we just show them. It's just like beginning of a lot of problem in future. Chidvay, Majdal. Chidvit. You know, no one can forget this disaster. No one, no girl can forget, okay, she's been raped one day, but she have to, like, uh, stand up again. Always, there should be someone to say truth. Maybe we will pay our life for it, but in the end, all of us will die. So it's a difference that we will make in our life. And if everyone shot, so no change will be. What women would have to say if they were really given a chance is anyone's guess. But the strength is most visible when they refuse to respond to hatred with hatred. أنت هنا بالمجتمع ماكو أي قيمة إنه بس مجرد الرجال إلى قيمة إلى مكانة وخلاص أنت واحد أذاش ها هي لازم تتبعين هاي الأذية وتسكتين وخلاص نجيب الغير إذا ما نسوي هي شيء راح نطق لا ترجمها
uh, was really interesting for us is that when we met these girls, they have a lot of like in, in, in strong uh, dignity, a sense of identity and honor. That's something that really, I think, matters a lot because the way we look at the world is the way we create a narrative and they have the right to, to have their say in this. فنحن اشخاص متسامحين وطبعا هذا الشيء دليل على قوتنا وهذا الشيء دليل على وجودنا حاليا نحن بالعراق انه ما طلعنا خارج العراق موجودين ودنا نقاوم ودنا نواجه المشاكل والتحديات الموجوده كلها طبعا التعليم هو سلاح الكل كل احد بالمجتمع وانه هو هو اللي يضمن المستقبل فاني من خلال قصتي احث كل طالب بالعالم انه يجتهد لانه من يحصل على العلم يحصل على حياه حياه زينه There's no difference between me and, and any man I can be successful I can do anything I want I can prove myself and I'm struggle every day fight every day to be because I want to be Olivia as least not famous person no just to be simple person who can give support and help for most of people and that's my hope um, I want to be yeah thank you <laughs>